Steve Hassan, and I welcome you to uh, this program. Um, I'm a member of the program in Psychiatry and the Law at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we're honored to have the second speaker be the co-founder of the program in Psychiatry and the Law, Thomas Futile, former president of ILMH on the dad as well. And we have a special guest, a discussant, uh, Dr. Barry Roth who will be uh, commenting as well. He's an expert on torture, forensic psychiatrist, and member of the program in psychiatry and the law. So, who thinks we need to update the law regarding undue influence? So I talk to lawyers and judges, and they talk about there's a slippery slope, and one person's religion is another person's cult, and, or everything is mind control, or there's no such thing as mind control or brainwashing. And um, I come to you with a very distinctive bias, uh, which I will tell, explain in a second. Uh, but I do want to, this is my website, which after I've written, and this is my disclosure, I've written these books. This gets me into a lot of trouble with people by the title. Um, and even people who were helped by this book over the last 30 years who converted to Trumpism and thought I was recruited by the cult of Soros and was influenced by the libtard media. Um, and they attempted to try to deprogram me from being critical of God's choice, Donald Trump. Um, how did I get into this weird field? Well, in 1974, the same month Patty Hearst was abducted by the Sindhianese Liberation Army, um, which was a political cult for those people who don't remember Patty Hearst. She was an heiress, kidnapped at gunpoint, thrown in, in a trunk of a car, locked in a closet, turned to Tanya, and uh, shot up a bank and a sporting goods store and was sentenced um, to jail for her crimes. Well, I got recruited at Queens College, which is in New York City. By the way, I grew up 1.3 miles from Donald Trump in Queens, New York. Well, I was at Queens College, an upper junior, a creative writing major, and my girlfriend dumped me, and I was sitting in the cafeteria waiting for my spring semester to begin, and three women started flirting with me and asked if they could sit at my table. It's a much longer story, but I want to get to the meat of this presentation. I can just tell you that within a few weeks' time, I was radicalized. Uh, I dropped out of college, quit my job, was asked to throw out my poetry. Uh, I grew up a conservative Jew uh, and came to believe that the Holocaust was necessary. Uh, and I was groomed by Sun Myung Moon personally, and one of his top lieutenants, because he said democracy was satanic. We need the theocracy to change the world, to rule the world. I was promoted very high. I didn't have any power, I just had position but I got to sit in on top leadership meetings. Long story short, two and a half years later, due to sleep exhaustion, I nearly died in a van crash. And uh, after two weeks in the hospital, it led to a, a talk with my sister, who lovingly said, you have a nephew, I want, him to, I want him to know his uncle Stevie, which is how she talked about me, she's my older sister. Uh, and I had a cast from my, my, my uh, toes to my groin and on crutches. And uh, long story short, I, I agreed to be deprogrammed, not because I was disillusioned. Uh, I thought I was making a choice, that I was having a religious experience. Um, and, um, but I wanted to prove to my family that I wasn't brainwashed and I wasn't in a cult. So I agreed to meet with the ex-members, one of whom I had recruited into the cult. She was my spiritual daughter. Uh, her name is Gladys. And um, what helped me was learning about Chinese communist brainwashing. 
In particular, they use chapter 22 of Robert J. Lifton's book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. And as we went through the eight points about Chinese communist brainwashing, they all fit the moon organization, which was very perplexing because we were God and they were Satan. Hmm. But it was the following day when I realized Moon was a liar. And if he was a liar, then he's not trustworthy. And if he's a liar, he couldn't be God's man on earth who was going to bring paradise. And I cried for three hours. And I was ashamed, embarrassed, confused, and didn't know what to do with my life. But I was really desperately wanting to understand what happened to me. Because I highly educated, good, solid family. And uh, uh, so I, I basically reached out to Dr. Lifton and said, Dr. Lifton, your book helped save my life. Can I talk to you about how the movies work? He said, come and talk with me. And long story short, he said, Steve, I've only studied it secondhand, but they did it to you and you did it to other people, so you need to study psychology and explain it to people like me. And here I stand 46 years later. It's been quite a journey. Became a mental health professional. <clears throat> who, think, who has ever heard of the Moonies? I'm just curious. So, he would do mass weddings. He'd line up the men and women and say, you and you, and you had to be married, right? He did 30,000 couples in one, one day. Um, he owns the Washington Times. He's dead. He died in 2012. She took over for the cult, but two of the sons rebelled and wanted to take over. And this is one of the sons, Sean Moon, who has created a religious cult called the Rod of Iron Ministry, and he believes that God wants us to have AR-15s. And it's his other brother, Justin Moon, happens to have a gun factory that makes AR-15s. Yeah. Um, and they now bought two compounds where they're training people how to murder. Um, this is a crown of golden bullets that this guy wears. And you can look on his website. January 6th. Oh, please come. Yeah. Could you ask people to slide in. Or... I'm, I'm honored Judge Goodson has joined us. Thank you so much. So, uh, Sean Moon was, was there, and he was broadcasting it was Antifa. And the movie paper, Washington Times, was saying it was Antifa too. So, because I was so high up in the cult and I knew the ideology, um, and I'm just going to ask people to either stand up or slide in, so we can expect some more people to come. And I'd rather you not go this way because I'm videotaping, so if you don't mind, people could slide over. I'd really appreciate it. Um, so, very briefly, About seven years ago, after 40 years of activism, I said to myself, nothing's changing. In fact, it's getting worse. And um, through my contact with Dr. Gutile and the other experts at the forensic think tank, it, it dawned on me that the law is about 100 years out of date. The law presumes that humans are rational agents. They are not. They're rationalizing agents. But um, there's some knowledge about testamentary capacity and undue influence. By the way, that term is 300 plus years old, British common law. Can I ask you to go that way? Because I'm recording. Thank you. It just asks people to move in, please. Um, lost my train of thought. What was I saying? 300 years old. Huh? The term undue influence. Yes. So, so basically, Another professor, uh, head of research at the program in psychiatry and the law said, Steve, if you want to change the law, you need a doctorate. You, got to, you should do a quantitative study on your model. Even though you know you've been helping people exit cults for 40 years, you need to prove it scientifically if you want to change the law. So in fact, I did it. 
and I finished it in my dissertation in 2020. Well, so now I'm going to go faster, but I want to, please don't go that way. Sorry, it's so 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 much to Okay, thank you very much for walking up front of the video camera. So, <laughs> the Diagnostic Statistical Manual and the ICD has a category, which I'm going to read. Identity disturbance due to prolonged and intense coercive persuasion. Individuals who have been subjected to intense coercive persuasion, e.g. brainwashing, thought reform, indoctrination while captive, torture, long-term uh, political imprisonment, recruitment by sects, cults, or by terror organizations, may present with prolonged changes in and conscious questioning of their identity. So the easiest way to describe it is the old Steve Hassan, the, the Jewish kid who wanted to be a poet and a teach creative writing, became the moon Steve Hassan that was cloned in the image of some near moon. I was told to pray and think like him and feel like him and walk like him and talk like him. And in fact, Moon said I was the model member at one point. But the real me was still there. But it was like my brain had been hacked. And I, can, I have a whole other presentation on how that happens. But that's the key point I want people to understand, especially if you have a loved one who's been radicalized in the cult of Trump or some other type of extremist group. Another distinguished forensic psychiatrist. Thank you, Bill, for coming. So this is my dissertation. If you want a one-stop shop for the theories, Lifton's theory, Margaret Singer's theory, Edgar Schein's theory, those were the three principal mental health researchers about Chinese communist brainwashing in the 60s. So I have their models, and then I included um, uh, trafficking law, right? Sex trafficking and labor trafficking, which is fraud, force, or coercion. And I've been doing a lot of work with sex trafficking victims and training officials, as well as uh, labor trafficking. Uh, so fraud and coercion, they love my model because it really helps them flesh out the specific behaviors that are concerning. So this, uh, I also put a copy, a PDF of my dissertation on my website if you want an easy place. So Alan Shefflin wrote a book in 1978 called The Mind Manipulators about MKUltra. He's a, a Santa Clara law professor, now he's emeritus, and so I've known him for that many years, and he's come up with a way that experts can talk to judges and juries and say, your honor, the influencer, stereotypical profile is malignant narcissism, which I have the specific characteristics on my website, uh, and in chapter three of the cult of Trump, because I took Trump, compared him with Jim Jones, Hubbard of Scientology, and my former cult leader. Um, and then the influencee and their unique vulnerabilities, whether it's situational vulnerability, which was what happened to me, but other people may have been traumatized, sexually abused, any number of other types of, on the spectrum, other types of vulnerabilities. But he does the how, what, when, where. And my model, which, which my dissertation was on, I just go back to it, is called the bite model of authoritarian control. I decided to title my dissertation and get as many search terms in the title as possible. But this, this is really a great model for people to think about. And my model, thanks to Dr. Roth two days ago, which I said I, I have two models. He said, no, you have one model with two components. And I'm like, duh, you're so right, Barry. <laughs> so if you think about ethical influences and informed consent, and unethical influence is lying outright lying, withholding vital information, or distorting information. This is on my website, too. You're welcome to take pictures, but I have a downloadable PDF on my website of this. But I'm a love guy. But when I was in the cult, it was all binary thinking, us versus them, good versus evil, 
uh, objectifying other human beings that didn't believe. In fact, Moon said, when we take power in America, we'll amend the Constitution and make it a capital offense for people who don't follow the rules of the Unification Church. And at the time, I thought, good idea, Father. We can save them in the spirit world. Sure. So, back to the slide of January 6th. If I hadn't been deprogrammed, I could have been there. I really could have. I was trained to kill on command or die on command without question or thought. If it is time to question Vance, I can tell you more about how that happened. Leaders and organization. I, how am I doing on time? I should finish shortly. But this is really important. Oh, so how do you tell what's on this side? It's the bite model. And what is the bite model? It's controlling behavior information, thoughts, and emotions. And on my website, and I do have a laminated printout if you want to see the micro steps, controlling sleep, clothing, isolating people from critics and former members, teaching them thought stopping, installing phobias. So there's a laundry list, and of course some cults are worse. The extremist terrorist groups are over here. How many people went to the online radicalization session the other day? Nobody. Okay. Anyway, I did a chapter in an Oxford University text that just came out called Lone Actor Terrorism. And my chapter is called Online Radicalization. And so it's my thesis and my experience, because I've been helping people who've been radicalized online. I actually think I understand the main components of how people are hypnotized and indoctrinated into QAnon and other extremist beliefs. The media has been saying crazy conspiracy theories. I, I, I analyze QAnon as a cult under the Bible model. Oh, and I want to say, for me, cults exist on the whole continuum. Like, I'm an avid scuba diver, you know? I will spend lots of money and travel anywhere and talk to strangers about diving. I'm also a John Lennon fan, and you can go on to other things where you can have a passion, be really into it, but you know what you're into, you can question it, you can leave without fear, intimidation, or harassment. Right, so cults on a continuum. I'm talking about authoritarian cults. And when I say that, I mean they can be religious cults, political cults, pseudotherapy cults, large group awareness training cults, commercial cults like MLMs, trafficking. So, and it could be one-on-one -on -one, uh, controlling person. And in fact, another professor of law who presented earlier, Frances Chapman, uh, did her dissertation on, uh, on uh, domestic abuse and applying undue influence in that context. I'm almost finished, guys. Um, so there's more to tell. Uh, I, I, I welcome you, you, if I've piqued your curiosity, to, um, to think about this. But every, every, testamentary capacity is one expertise of Dr. Butile, but over the years, we've talked about so many other areas of mind control. We even had a judge who had been hypnotized in law school and raped. And that's what I forgot to say. Those two cases that was in the abstract. Forgive me. Forgive me. So when we first met and we went to lunch, he told me he had been asked to evaluate a young man who was in my former cult because he wanted to give all of his, his trust funds to the movies. And he said, I did the standard testamentary capacity evaluation. I'll let him explain. But he didn't feel comfortable putting his reputation on the line and saying he shouldn't be allowed to give his money over to the movies. But what I'm aiming for is developing science, but also a methodology to evaluate undue influence in a variety of contexts. Uh, and I'll just say elder, elderjusticecal.org uh, is concerned about elderly people being unduly influenced. They've even developed a scale and a training program. So that's one uh, piece. And the other case that I wanted to talk about was a divorce attorney who it turned out 
was hypnotizing his female clients who were already vulnerable because they were going through a divorce, hypnotizing them, molesting them, and then giving them amnesia to the molestation. And he done, had done it to many women until a lawyer client who was getting divorced went home after meeting with him and she discovered her panties on backwards and a wet stain. And she knew that she always puts her panties on the right way. <laughs> so she went to the police, they did a, a forensic evaluation. There was no semen, it was wet, but there was no semen. And the police said, if you can't tell us what happened, there's nothing we can do. And this savvy woman, the next time she saw him, put on a voice recorder and recorded his molestation, brought it to the police. Another uh, teacher, Dan Brown, uh, co-author with Shefflin of Memory, Trauma, Treatment, and the Law, was called in by the prosecution to verify this was hypnosis, this is how it was using. Um, that they did a stink, and the guy's in jail now. But there's no law against hypnotizing someone. So I think he was charged with kidnapping. I don't know where that came from. But he did a plea deal. But there needs to be a law about and criminalize this activity. And because I've gone over time, I'm going to end and pass the baton to my mentor, uh, Dr. Thomas Butel. Thank you. What many of those in the room may not be aware of is uh, Dr. Hassan's heroism in an extremely difficult context uh, two meetings ago, or one meeting ago, two years, more than two years ago. And this was in Rome, and one of the, uh, let's call them the cult members, uh, threatened to shut down the entire meeting if Stephen was allowed to speak. And uh, very, um, very courageously and very courageously and gener generously, Stephen agreed to do that, even though obviously it was a it cost him stuff and cost him time and effort and so forth, and we had the meeting. But it does suggest uh, the extent to which some folks will go in following cult notions. And I will just add, the person was, he was in a, it, reportedly in Opus Dei, which is a Catholic authoritarian cult, and he said to uh, David Weistub that I wrote the cult of Trump. And I dare to mention William Barr being associated with Opus Dei. So he didn't want me to come to Italy at all. And then the media refused to present it. Anyway, thank you so much. Now, you've heard uh, a very seminal discussion on, on issues of the theory here. I'm going to take this into the much more practical realm and talk about some uh, areas, uh, what I like to call pitfalls in this whole area in terms of assessment, in terms of theory, in terms of practice. So let's take a look at some of those. Now, don't be shocked. This is the Harvard CME disclosure. Uh, if you um, were to ask me to explain this, I will say, well, I actually can't do that because uh, I don't understand it, but I've done my part. There we go. Um, California's elder abuse laws prov uh, provides one form of in undue influence definitions takes four components. A personal vulnerable to undue influence, that's the victim, if you will, influencee, you could also say. The apparent authority of the wrongdoer. Now that can be family, that can be uh, you know, hierarchy, it can be all kinds of things. Number three, the actions and tactics of the wrongdoer. And number four, an inequitable result. Now that's uh, going to be a pivotal point, uh, but in, in California, the elder abuse law requires an inequitable result. We'll come back to that. Other defining factors that are in the litigation uh, legislation in this area. A person's free will is overcome by another. A person's free will is supplanted by that of another. Look at, look at the size of that bar. A person is pressured to this or seduced taking over basic decisions in the victim's life, for example, a financial one. Um, in looking at physicians who commit sexual misconduct with patients in one of the areas of interest, I was impressed by how often the first step on the downward path is the doctor offers <coughs> to help the patient with their checkbook. Okay? Now you say, well, what, what good is that? How is that going to help anyone? And the answer is it, the person is demonstrating a kind of artificial trust in the 
under transference. Number two, uh, you get to know what, what the person's financial condition is, and it allows you to say, well, gee, you seem to be spending an awful lot in this area. Why don't you go over this area? So there are those uh, different variations. So I was puzzled by that because it seemed like a little a strange uh, thing, but it is out there. Um, basic cases, the earliest one was the House of Lords and the Royal Bank of Scotland versus Ettridge, way back. Uh, more recently, in Nebraska, Melusek versus Meyer. You're welcome to uh, uh, check, track these down for specific interest, but it's more irrelevant to look at the current issues rather than the historical ones. Now, this is um, some, some cautions to assessors of undue influence. Number one, someone exerts inappropriate influence over a testator vulnerable to such influence. And the classic example, Jack, we actually had Anna Nicole Smith, yeah. Mm -hmm. A nurse who tends the dying millionaire inherits and cuts out the family. And a lot of people told that was going on there. I, I don't, didn't evaluate the case, but that's, that's what it looked. That's what it says in the papers. Uh, it's important to distinguish due influence from undue influence because there is such a thing as due influence, and I'm, I'm suggesting it's not wrong. For example, natural favoritism in the family. Um, one of the, uh, the consultations involved uh, one of four children who constantly took the parent to uh, medical exams and gave him lifts to various places. It was basically right in their pitching and became the favorite, which I thought was uh, perfectly reasonable. And that's, that's uh, one version. The other one is what I call the reward of the faithful and loyal. Uh, the butler may get the preference over family because they're considered to be faithful and loyal. Right? I'm making that example up. Now, clues to undue influence. The influence limits the testator's contact, the state's contact with family. Very critical early step. May convey to family that the testator has said they are not wanted. We call this, of course, in the clinical work splitting. But it is a familiar first step, and it's the kind of thing that leaps out at you uh, when you can actually follow that thought. Blocking mail and calls both ways. Again, isolating, driving a wedge between the family and the, the uh, uh, influencer. Number two, interfering with visit, preventing canceling, uh, sorry, preventing, canceling, sitting in on, and disrupting. And uh, the case I was involved in uh, involved phone calls during the other parents' time. Uh, this was a, a uh, will contest, but the uh, daughter who was uh, almost cut out of the will, uh, would have a visit with the father, and in the middle of the visit, the father would call her up, is that the mother would call the daughter up and say, your dollies are calling for you and crying. And at that point, the child would melt down and demand to be taken back to the mother. Right, again, influential issue there. We've talked about the Shefflin social influence model. We've talked about the bite band, we've just been through that. Uh, I was struck by some of these features relating to uh, Dr. Burnett's concept of, of parental alienation. There seems to be a fair amount of overlap uh, in those two ideas, but I leave that to you to uh, decide. Cults is what we're talking about. And you could also add advertising in general. Advertising could be looked at as a kind of form of undue influence used by uh, slogans, images, imagery, um, and repetition, and all the kind of uh, influence mechanisms that are well known to us from other contexts. Now, I'm going to take for a moment to digress over to testamentary capacity, of which there are two types. Anti-mortem, where the, uh, the testator wants to suit-proof their will and has a pre-mortem psychiatric interview to, again, dispose of some of the objections that might be raised. And then the post-mortem post -mortem version, which is the more common version, obviously twice as difficult. It's often difficult to determine because the right questions were not asked at the time. A person may go to their family doctor because they're feeling poorly or losing their mind, memory, and stuff like that, but the doctor has not asked the critical questions about testimony capacity, which are, uh, you know, uh, knowledge of a will, knowledge of the natural areas of one's bounty, and uh, knowledge of one's estate. Uh, so those are not classic medical questions. And so 
that sort of thing is not helpful with rare exceptions to the, to the evaluator. Uh, one thing I also want to stress, even after obtaining contemporary data, the answer may be, I can't tell. <coughs> and although there will be those doctors who will treat that as a narcissistic injury, the point is that you need to, when you don't know, just admit you don't know, especially because you're going to be under oath. So keep that in mind. It's not a shame, it's not a failure, it's not an error, right? Sometimes you can't tell. Litigants may use general medical, neurological, or imaging data to make a case for testamentary incapacity or vulnerability to undue influence. Rarely do those address the specific criteria, which I've just put out for you. Uh, one a classic example was um, a um, person was depressed near their death, and the heirs uh, brought a uh, claim of, un of uh, testimony capacity because lots of depressed people have small vessel disease. Now, that was the extent of, this, of the testimony. Obviously, you know, we do this for a living. We're not going to buy that. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, when I was testifying, I looked around the courtroom where most people were over middle age, and I said, just looking around this courtroom, I'd be surprised if we didn't have a large number of people with small vessel disease on the American diet. And the judge thought that was really cool. Common forensic pitfalls included failing to address functional capacity at time, not uh, you know, uh, other capacities or inability to walk or to remember names and so forth, but functional capacity. Two, assuming that mental or organic illness is itself disqualified, which it isn't, like everything else in forensics, this is a criteria-driven assessment. And three, assuming structural damage to the brain is as disqualified, as I just uh, described, without an effect on resistance to influence. A person may have small vessel disease, but be perfectly capable of being uh, aware that they're being led down the garden path. Confusing due influence with undue influence and feeling pressed to conclude, even though there's insufficient data to form an opinion, right? Now, here's uh, one that I have real serious concerns about. The, the trend in some assessors to operate as if criteria were fairness, not testator's choice. I refer to those folks as strict constructionists versus, as I refer to them as loose constructionists. They're going to make everything better by deciding whatever the the state of wants are going to do it their way, versus strict instructionist in which category I, I include myself, because I want to see those three criteria. I don't care if it feels unfair to two-thirds of the people in the family. And the assessors involved may be a forensic practitioner, relatives, judges, and so forth. But uh, in my uh, textbook, I have this uh, image. The uh, testator is allowed to leave his estate to a home for unwed guppies. And if that's their choice and they're confident, uh, you know, it's idiosyncratic, but a little off the mark, but it's possible and we'll get legit. Uh, this is the article I was referring to, which I'll leave up there for a moment in case you wanted to uh, uh, grab that. Uh, and uh, it's in the Apple Journal. And uh, it reviews a number of these points at ex with a more extensive uh, uh, way. And um, also, if you need to reach me, here. Thank you. And while Barry was talking, I'll just say from my point of view, if Tom knew me as an ex-Mooney and he was asked to evaluate someone who wanted to give millions of dollars to the Moonies, I would have encouraged a, a more in-depth evaluation, like talk to the family and uh, even begin to ask questions like, what happens if you give over your, all your money and in a year you realize you don't want to be in this group anymore and you don't have anything? You know, a myriad of what if questions could really be very, very powerful and useful, uh, as well as uh, suggesting the person talk to former members, talk to experts on brainwashing first, before making a decision so that they could understand. Because I didn't understand what happened to me until my deprogramming. My name is Barry Roth. 
uh, clinical and forensic psychiatrist. And uh, the main thing you need to know is if you want to know what a lucky person looks like, I am a lucky person. Um, I joked about having the bragging rights to be on this panel, but uh, Tom started teaching me in 1975, and recent weeks I called him for help and consultation. I mean, it's just ongoing. And uh, Steve and Bandy Lee, who Matthew will be referring to, are people who've really stuck their necks out. Uh, dangerous case of Donald Trump, cult of Donald Trump, and uh, I think deserve great uh, gratitude as well as um, fortitude for, for what they face. So. <clears throat> There are three points that I will try to do to wrap in and wrap up and extend what others are, are saying. Uh, there's a spectrum of influence. There's something of a disconnect between law and nominally what we call mental health. And vocabulary and words matter. So undue influence, as you were told, relates to somebody in a position of trust could exploit and did exploit. Uh, Tom has taught a great deal about boundaries, and crossing is when you bend the rules to do something helpful, and violation is when you break the rules to do something wrong. And I will be referring to that in relation to our roles if I speak properly, you will go away with the sense you already know everything I had to say, but maybe in a minute or a day or a week or a month or a year, you're going to say, aha. So I, I dwell in my training. Again, Tom is the preeminent example of that. And I use ordinary, conventional, mainstream, uh, tools, but what is important isn't always easy to see, and what's easy to see doesn't always operate the way you think, and so when we get into undue influence, that's uh, where, where I hope to make a, a, a uh, push the envelope. Torture is an extreme example of using influence on consciousness. Consciousness. Now, laws are of various sorts, but they are like the DSM, designations by consensus. There's no inherent reality. On the other hand, we're in mental health, you have a hard time saying what it looks like, the shape, the smell, the weight, and the location, but it is our universal experience that we are aware that it has always been there and interactive, the nature of mind, so sometimes called luminous and unchanging and, and empty meaning and context. And when I would ask torture survivors how did they survive, is breaking is not so hard to understand. The point being, I am standing on the shoulders of my near contemporaries in through space and time. So when <coughs> survivors would tell me how they did survive, it was ancestors, religion, friends, family, hopes for the future, non-material ties and bonds and connections. No inherent reality. Nature of mind, it is these non-material ties and bonds and connections, which are our a priori categorical imperative of who we are as human beings. Okay. Now, there are laws that are explicit about this. Rome statute, genocide, mental harm to groups, torture, mental pain or suffering, war crime of torture, mental pain or suffering, Regionally in the Western Hemisphere, any act, mental pain or suffering on a person, to obliterate the personality or their capacity. And even in the United States, 
with Guantanamo. <coughs> the law, mental harm, mental pain, mind-altering substances, disrupt the personality, or somebody witnesses that being done to someone else. I mean, it couldn't be more, more straightforward. Well, so Berko Brecht wrote an essay which I read in the 60s. And what was difficult to tell the truth? And he said, you know, you, you got to be clever. So he said, Confucius took a calendar and where it read, somebody was killed, he said, was assassinated. Where it read, killed, murdered, assassination executed. And millennia changed after that. So what interests me most is the acknowledgement in our field, denial, aka lies, are the psychic equivalent of annihilation. So lies, misinformation, disinformation, flooding the space with useless information, all kinds of other propaganda. Segue on a spectrum from we should try to help people do the right thing and respect who they are and respect that we don't want to change them to make them something they are not, to the kinds of civil things that happen to the kinds of uncivil things that happen in cults, to the kind of really fascist things that happen January 6th. And we in the States were on the edge of the precipice with our toes over the edge and the wind blowing very hard. And it ain't over yet. So I'd like to make the point, low intensity warfare which is waged by occupying powers to dominate, uses psychological, social, economic, diplomatic means, as well as propaganda, as well as military. And there's a spectrum. And at an extreme end is torture. Terror uses violence to coerce and intimidate. Torture uses violence to coerce and intimidate. When there is torture, there is state terror. But this, like the spectrum of influence, is a spectrum. These things are not one-off. They are related. And that's the point I'm trying to make. From very ordinary, mainstream, conventional, mental health, forensic mental health evaluations. We have tools and we have access. So, so it, when I was looking this up, these things are from the Air Force. And they'll talk about control. And they'll talk about control. And then perfectly clear from their point of view, this is one of the things they do. So I wanted to be explicit that I'm standing on these shoulders. I want to be explicit I'm standing on Bandy's, Bandy Lee and Matthew's shoulders. And that Bandy Lee said to Steve, can I pick that up in my NGO? So she wrote a New York Times bestseller. And Steve, on the cover of his book, the version I have, is her statement that it should be a central region. And both of them have and continue to go up against a figure who nominally commanded the largest, most powerful military in the world and the largest GDP. And one cannot say enough from there. So, Thank you very much. Matthew. Okay. Okay, so what what you just heard from Steve of ways to protect the minds of the national level. 
Oh, no, I'm going to talk about protecting the land at the national level, also the international level. Namely, the uh, UN recognized human rights to freedom of life. I start off with a brief overview of freedom of mind in history, then the pre existing legal basis for freedom of mind, and then the justification why we need freedom of mind. So, freedom of mind, depending on how you search it, it has an earliest time as the end of the uh, 1500s. Uh, it appears most, uh, the most interesting appearance is in a play by Thomas, where a sorcerer kidnaps a uh, noble woman and tries to seduce her with the charms of bodily pleasure. She resists his attempts and she exerts her freedom of mind. And the message given by this is that no matter what you do, you will never have my freedom of mind. You can take away my body, you will never get my soul. However, there were also references in the literature to protecting freedom of mind. Why do we protect something that's already innate to human nature? Is this contradictory? Uh, freedom of mind appears in uh, texts about the American Revolution and also in anti colonial and anti segregationist writings. The idea that mental slavery can take away my, uh, that the real obstacle to human freedom is not in the physical constraints, it is in the mind. Malcolm X, for example, talks about the house negro, the black slave who loved his master and all his heart and soul. Go on. There, Joyce Carey ties freedom of mind to liberty for the first time in writing. Uh, French, the French La Liberté d'Esprit enters into the uh, literature and slightly later, but not that much. Um, and Antoine de Saint Exupéry, he writes Je ne, je ne connais qu'une liberté, c'est la liberté d'Esprit. It's also associated with Paul Valery, another French writer. Uh, freedom of mind appears in Buddhist writings, and it's understood as a sort of freedom of mind from the unwanted or uncontrolled forces or processes of inner, sort of inner peace, uh, creativity, imagination. Uh, freedom of mind is also associated with cognitive liberty theories, and cognitive liberty theories argue for the freedom of mind, understood as the right to control your own consciousness, it, be it through uh, mind altering drugs or neuro enhancements, trans uh, DBS, TTR. Freedom of mind in the context of mental health. And then this is how I came across it freedom of mind as in response to the problem of authoritarian powers. Okay, so the first call for freedom of mind that I found was in 1848, the for a universal and most determined record of the freedom of mind. Then later, uh, over a century later, there was a call for mental privacy, an international right to mental privacy, to protect dissidents and patients from involuntary incarceration, particularly in the Soviet Union, but also in the United States. Then you heard from Alan Shefflin before, he wrote, he made a call in 1982, stronger and more explicit protection for the mind must be written into the international documents. The task will not be an easy one. International consensus will have to be obtained on such issues as what constitutes freedom of mind. This is a formidable undertaking, and yet the world cannot afford to be in a defensive position. Moving forward a decade, uh, in 1990, an EU committee investigating the problem of Carl's call for any um, type of treaty to prevent acts which jeopardize human freedom. Again, the cognitive liberty theorists have made various calls of human right to mental self-determination, cognitive liberty. More recently, some of them have moved to an all-encompassing protection, the freedom of the mind. And then in 2020, we have the first declaration of freedom of the mind. Just in way of some background, the World Mental Health Coalition produced this following the second impeachment and amidst the silencing of uh, mental health professionals who have a duty to warn. So this is the first, as I mentioned, it's the first document. And finally, we have a blueprint, uh, something which we can use to take for any future submission to the United Nations. So there is something called rights inflation uh, that we could create a human right for almost every single social practice. So some people have introduced quality control for rights. A human right must reflect a fundamentally important social value be consistent but not merely re re repetitive of existing human rights. 
achieve a very high degree of international consensus, sufficiently precise, respond to a serious threat, and impose burdens that are justifiable and no larger than necessary. I believe that the human right to freedom of mind meets all these criteria. Its existing basis is in the international human rights architecture, intrinsic freedom. All humans are born free. No one should be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery should be prohibited in all their forms. One, personality rights, the right to be a person who has integrity, inviolability of one's person, privacy rights, freedom of thought, belief, conscience. Now, there are three things in, contained within these rights. No one should be coerced into holding them. People should have the freedom to seek and impart information and ideas. And that children should have access to information from a diversity and variety of sources. The right to mental health, which is explicitly catered for in the International Human Rights Treaties. Moreover, that no one should be subjected to any mental suffering or any medical or scientific expert. Okay, so there is a foundational hierarchy to human rights, with prerequisite rights for the existing rights. Freedom of mind is the prerequisite for the other rights. What use is freedom of thought if you do not have freedom of mind? What use is freedom of speech if you do not have freedom of thought? Now, human rights are ne both positive and negative. They're negative in the sense that they, they protect them against a violation against oneself. But they're positive in the sense that they give you entitlement to a service, freedom from misinformation, propaganda, freedom to think, believe, and vigilance. Now, I mentioned cognitive liberty theorists before. They're arguing for a freedom of mind in a very different way to the Declaration. The Declaration speaks of freedom of mind through the sense of education. Cognitive liberty theorists are arguing for expanding the mind for neuro enhancements. So, any future development of the human mind will have to either expand to include cognitive liberty theorists and this expansive use of uh, the mind, or be limited. Okay, so, human rights are reflected in three ways in international law the treaties, covenants, and conventions, which are negotiated between states. These have full legal force. Customary law, which is the notion that law develops from consistent practice by states, even if there is no pre-existing law, consistent practice of states over time will contribute to human rights law. And lastly, declarations, which are submitted to the United Nations General Assembly and will, uh, and which by nature are declaratory, but which do not have uh, legal force in of themselves. We call them hard law and soft. Okay. So, in terms of a brief history, we began with the Declaration in 1948, declaratory, no legal force. This was then followed by two covenants a few decades later. What does this mean for the freedom of mind? Will, we, will, it, will a declaration suffice, or will an international covenant suffice with full legal force? There's a question whether the freedom of mind will require the development of pre-existing rights or the addition of new, mind-specific rights. It's unclear whether the pre-existing human rights will cater and will deliver enough protection for the mind today and in the future. And the answer to that question will tell us whether a declaration or a covenant, a treaty, will suffice to protect the mind. Any future declaration will have to be translated into the five official languages of the UN. This is from the working groups of the uh, UDHL. So this is the linguistical nightmare that's going to face any future coalition. Every single word and phrase will have to be translated into five different languages. And this also <coughs> presents an opportunity for opponents of freedom of mind to push back and to try and water down the right and reduce its strength. So, how do we get from here to here? Freedom of mind as a human right is a fundamentally political undertaking. It's not simply legal. And what I want to pursue, as what I want to identify as a pathway from freedom of mind into the human rights architecture, and I'm hoping to pursue this at a pedagogical level. Human rights are more than law. 
they, they have more than law. They have a, they're, they exist in society as well as law. So there's a risk in only focusing on legal aspects. Individuals need to know what a right constitutes if they are to make a claim for that right. So, when you search freedom of mind in Wikipedia, this is what you get. You get Stephen Hassan, Individualism and Free Will. Even the subrights don't have any pages, except with the exception of cognitive liberty. So I'm hoping to start building on the Wikipedia pages just to create a more popular understanding of the freedom of mind. Okay, now, why do we need it? There are different ways we understand which someone's freedom of mind can be taken away. The disassociated pre-cut cells, introduction. These are more in this, these are in the in, in the instances of cults. Also doubling, uh, this is how the Nazi doctors would maintain a cell while they carried out experimentation in prisoners, and uh, would continue a normal life outside of the concentration camps. And then in a more general way, you have the false self, with the real self hiding behind it. Okay. Steve Hamilton. You need to go, because we have more. We need to leave a little time okay. for questions. Um, so there's Plato's allegory of the cave that men were trapped inside the cave and all they saw was the shadows on the wall. The shadows were more real than reality. And when, man, when one man was free from his cage, he came back to free the others. And they reacted violently and rejected his attempts to impart knowledge upon them. So I call this rational ignorance when the cost of knowledge exceeds the benefits of that knowledge. No one wants to be lied to, and no one wants to admit they've been lied to. So some people speak of the freedom of the cage. I don't find this, I find this quite oxymoronic. I prefer the security of the cage, but absolutely there is a security. I mean, I've lived in uh, authoritarian and totalitarian societies, and some people really don't want freedom, you know? They don't want information. They don't want to act on their own, you know? It's not something that comes naturally, and I don't think it's, the natural human condition until recently. Um, so is there more access denied or access not wanted? So what does this mean? Does the fact that some human, some people don't are unwilling or unable to exercise freedom of mind <coughs> eliminate the need for it? Not one bit. This is based on a profound misunderstanding of how human rights work. You don't need to justify why you need a right. You don't need to say, I have freedom of speech because I have something to say. Now, I also work as a teacher, and over half my class are from Hong Kong. And over 100,000 Hong Kongers have recently left the country. And when you ask them why, they will say consistently, we did it for our children. We did it for our children. As changes are made to the uh, curriculum in Hong Kong, as, as critical thinking is taken out, in the face of patriotic education, they're leaving. They're saying, we, we, they're, they're saying well, this is not what we want for our children. Mm. Same thing is happening in Turkey. Science <coughs> is being removed from the curriculum in the face of religion. The assault on the infant's mind is as much religious as it is political. So this is the 21st century assault on the infant's mind. This is the 21st century refugee exodus. And they're demanding our protection. They need our protection. But they need to understand what is happening to them. And they need, a, they need to understand the right to freedom of mind so they can more effectively make a claim for it. Is this going to work? No? Okay. The director of uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, James Cameron, recently made a public intervention. And he said this If Skynet wants to take over and wipe us out, it would actually look a lot like what's going on now. It'd be much cheaper and easier just to turn our minds against ourselves. Lastly, on human rights. Do not underestimate <coughs> the challenge facing the human rights system this century. Human rights have piggybacked and freeloaded on Western power, and as Western power fades, it may well take the human rights system with it. So, what if only fighting for its survival Human rights went on the offensive. And what better way to go on the offensive than the right to freedom of mind? 
And I'll finish with this quote from Snowden. It's this clash between the authoritarian and the liberal democratic that I believe to be the major ideological conflict of my time. How best to win this conflict than with freedom of mind as a human right? Wow. Wow. High five. Woo yes. Yeah, I, I am Ashok Van from the US. Uh, in terms of undue influence, it has been there uh, for a long time. Uh, for example, uh, is it true the Catholic Church, for example, got very rich sure. because the last rites were always given by the priest, and then they you didn't have, have anything to write. So what happens is uh, the priest would come and say, he donated such and such thing to that church. I, would, I actually, I'm going to interrupt you just for a purpose of time. I wrote a blog with a former Catholic priest about the schism in the Catholic Church with those people who love Jesus and believe that Jesus' words when he says, my kingdom is not of this world, and what's called dominionism or Christian nationalism, which is a big component of the cult of Trump. But that's one of my theses, is the cult of Trump is comprised of a lot of other cults, authoritarian cults including these new apostolic reformation uh, churches where the leaders say they're an apostle or prophet and get direct revelations and god told them trump was going to be elected in 2020 so the democrats must have <coughs> right so but I, I don't want to get too far off on the catholic church but we can look throughout history and, mm -hmm. and dr commons actually was the first one who said to me steve predator and prey Think predator and prey. That's that's the frame to, to think about. No, I'm sorry. Just to, I should just generalize and then say there are many religions or cults, however you want to say, what, where what? you can leave. I believe you are excommunicated. No family can talk. All that is a kind of. And I think that's abusive and mind control. Yes, I really do. Well, I say it a different way. Does it help or hurt? I mean, very simple. And the problems facing human beings uh, don't rely on dogma to be there. So the problems we're trying to solve are pre-dogma and pre-theologic. And I take issue with Steve because for 60 years I've identified myself as a radical, nonviolent, faith-based activist. And I say, Steve, radical means going to the roots. And I've been slammed and slandered with that for six decades trying to make things better. And where are you going to find a better person? I'm a radical of your definition. Well, too. that's right. And so I, I, the point I try to make is speak of the content and the substance because the labels are no good. I'm Jewish. In, and talking with Israelis, they say to them, tell me what Zionism means. I never use that word. And it's like, is. <clears throat> The concerns we have are fundamental and shared. If we look at what's common, that's what we see. If we look at what's different, that's what we see. I would take exception. Human rights, torture, and slavery are absolutely non derogable absolute, by all the statutes. Right to life is conditional on capital punishment is frowned upon, but it's not an absolute prohibition. I think the problem is that the states endorse, but they're the perpetrators. And that's that's where the tension is coming from. Next question. Yes. We want to leave time for our last presenter. Uh, hey, I'm fine. I yield my time. You sure? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, He's presenting yeah. next session, by the way. So. I just want you to relate uh, what you said to our, the theme of our previous session. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, freedom of mind, uh, yeah. how does that relate to the rights under the Convention for persons with disabilities in terms of equality before the law, in terms of the right to refuse psychiatric assessment, psychiatric yeah. diagnosis, psychiatric treatment? Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say on that? Not a lot, because it hasn't been developed yet. I mean, we have the Declaration of Freedom of Mind, but it doesn't make explicit reference to psychiatric treatment or the right. I mean, it builds on existing rights. I see it as a missing piece. Well, so, I, would, I would say it quite differently. Yeah. 2.1 billion 
people identify as Christian, 1.6 billion identify as Muslim. That's just the deists. And it, to me, it's so self-evident, it, 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 just, it, it just beggars discussion, because in the image of God, kingdom of God is within you, Buddha nature, Atman, I mean, regarding Trump, what I said is that God is on the side of the big battalions, meaning 40% of the people would be happy to throw all of us in five cars, or at least behave that way. And the question is, what about the other 60%? And as critical as I am about a lot of things in, in the States, I said most people, most of the time, want to believe they're doing the right thing. And the real, where the rubber meets the road is who's going to get to them, who's going to be clever. Steve spoke from his heart and his experience. Tom was again teaching. I, I, I refer to that article almost every time I do a consultation on that issue. You're looking at predatory, what we hope. Mm -hmm. But it's, it seems to me so fundamental that most human beings believe or want to believe or want to be helped to believe that there's a base of decency that what's there to discuss? And I would just say planetary survival is my bubble. Now the I right I, I really think we need to uh, be solution focused and work backwards because right now as you said we're going because authoritarians want to destroy America. They really do, because then they can take over more places, et cetera, et cetera. And there are, there are named groups, including Putin. He was very upset that the Soviet Union collapsed, and he's been on an agenda to destroy America. Yes, Tom? I just wanted to comment on, on your uh, remark, and I think you were absolutely right. But I was still um, appalled by the case of Rogers versus Commissioner, which was a right to refuse treatment case in Massachusetts. And the original decision was based on the freedom of psychotic thought as an argument against treatment. Substituted so, judgment. What would the person yeah. want for themselves? Right. So it, it, you know, there is an interweaving here of a number of different forces. I, I want to say that, that I feel an obligation to be positive and to not do a bombing run that floods you with so much information that's awful that all that happens is paralyzing. My son is a human rights expert and, of course, smarter than I am. And, you know, maybe we'll learn that I know something, but the hard rights, the blue rights, the rule of law, the civil rights, the red rights of economic rights, the soft rights of the environmental rights, the green rights. And what I assert, because I, 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 I have seen it and I believe it, is that the right to rule of law, the right to sustenance, the right to a safe home are universal, inseparable, non-derogable. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I just want to thank you for your presentations. They fit together quite nicely. And building up to Matt's uh, uh, the vulnerability of the end time of human rights. And yeah, and when I think about, uh, we're trying to put it in a historical context. In a way, none of these things are new. I mean, propaganda is not new, misinformation is not new, violence and torture are not new. These are centuries old phenomena. But in the 20th century, you know, with the rise of totalitarian regimes like the Nazi regime, Soviet regimes, totalitarian regimes especially are trying to control everything, including the inner person, right? You think of the Chinese re-education camps, etc. Exactly. Going into the 21st century, what do you think? I mean, these, these phenomena have been around as long as human beings have been around, but to what impact does modern technology change this equation for you? And this is for any of you. Uh, it, human beings did not evolve to be online. This is a new development, and it's changing our brains. Young people are on screens instead of playing in real life and having that connection and intimacy, and there are billionaires who are on the spectrum who want us to spend all of our energy in the metaverse, 
instead of being with real people and solving real problems. So um, has anyone heard of the uh, Center for Humane Technology? The what Social Dilemma? Does anyone watch The Social Dilemma? There's a documentary. So that's Tristan Harris, who is a former ethicist at Google, uh, humanetech.com. Uh, that's what they're trying to do, is uh, call out the destructiveness of platforms where they're, they're being used to monetize. Data is being collected. In the US, there are 5,000 mm -hmm. data points on every voting American that's been collected. And when you're online, unless you have wiped out all of the data, which I think is now impossible because it's on the dark web, and there are companies selling it to third parties like cults, you can be putting on you know, a virtual reality th thing to play gaming, but they could be playing and changing the faces to ones that you like, like people that you love, without you even knowing about it. Yeah, and but I think we need position. regulations. See, if you say, is technology weaponized against us? I mean, the American election, of course. It doesn't mean we lay down like a carpet and have people walk on us. But I would make the point that what was important is the, even in, in the undue influence and testamentary capacity, is the issue of trust, fiduciary, and the connections. That it, of course, I had to learn how to turn on a laptop and shut my phone off. I mean, of course, you have to know technology. And of course, you, you, you have to know how not to be dog meat and chewed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But if it were so, so powerful with the constant universal surveillance, doesn't that tell you something that there's, there's more force than that? And yes. That's the point that I think we, oh, I, I, I we have to make. Did you want to say something? Yes. yes. Um, <clears throat> So I have a question that I think sort of uh, ties your presentations together with regards to rejecting information. Well, kind of comments. It seems to me that a lot of the impetus to really like reject information that you find personally disagreeable comes from that you're practically clinging to a sense of self and a self of reality that derives from your own worldview, the way you perceive the world around you. Because you have your own self-worth tied up in that, uh, any information that threatens your worldview, that threatens your perspectives, is uh, recognized as a threat to the self and therefore rejects it out of hand. It seems to me that this is... Which both... leads to confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. Yes. And well, all... It's also interactive. A slide that I took out because it was not much time. Individuals are the infinitesimal whose sum in the calculus of culture, creates society and civilization. So if somebody wants to say it's only individual or it's only collective, they don't know what they're talking about, and that isn't the way it works. Uh, well, the question I sort of have about that is, this does seem to play into both the question of freedom of mind, because you have people exercising a distinct unwillingness to entertain thoughts and ideas and information contrary to their own thinking. It also plays into how cults operate because they very much want you to develop that sense of self that is tied to your communal understanding, to the worldview. Uh, this is how things are and this is what makes you you. Right. Uh, but I at the agree. same time, it's not uh, exclusive to that either. Right. So I would uh, argue that humanity can either evolve or devolve. And if you study developmental psychology, if you're being a, a responsible parent, you want your child to grow up and have their own thoughts and values and make their own choices, as opposed to authoritarian parenting, where you want the kid to be a clone of you and yeah. obey you forever. Comma, right? comma. Every thought, every word, every act matters. And it's not like what we do doesn't matter. As soon as they get you burned to a crisp or feeling helpless and paralyzed, you have to do whatever you can to move back from them. Because we are either going to be protagonists or victims. So can I just say that I do for a living talk to people who've been indoctrinated into totalist authoritarian cults. 
What doesn't work, if I can use you for a minute, is saying, you're wrong. You're in a cult. You're brainwashed. You're believing crap, conspiracy theory theories, because that validates the programming that you're persecuting them, that you're the enemy. My whole, if you look at my material, my videos, and my books, the way to approach it is, hey, you're smart. You have a master's in international law. I'm really curious. How did you arrive at this belief? And then if they say, do your own research, it's like, no, go back in time. When, did the, when was the first time you heard of QAnon, for example, which was 2017, by the way. It, that was not a thing until 2000. But the idea is questioning is the power. And, basic and rapport and trust and compassion and, no, not like this. and taking the frame of also, convince me. Also. I'm, I'm willing to put myself out there to believe what you believe. But you have to break it down into smaller pieces. Yeah. And, but let's talk about it. So when people tell me, Steve, you're brainwashed. You're in the cult of Soros. I don't say, come on, I'm the world expert on brainwashing. I say, oh, really? Tell me why. That's an What's your theory. understanding about brainwashing? How interesting. Do you think the Chinese Communist government is brainwashing people? And then and the two the two topics that work are trafficking and Chinese communist brainwashing program. And then I can talk about the bite model, but the point is you have to separate your ego from your beliefs. And I'm gonna cite Adam Grant's book, Think Again, which is a brilliant book. And he says, listen, to have a scientific approach. We, we have hypotheses. We don't have the truth with a capital T that's black and white. Steve, we I know everything. You're making mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> How so, Barry? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> tell me more. Between the three of us or the four of us or the five of us in the whole group, uh, what everybody has something special to add, and maybe if we put it together, we'll make it. And, and I want to add that I'm part of a group of colleagues and friends who are all former cult members of one type or another, and we're trying to do a hashtag movement of I got out, like me too, to destigmatize it. It's like, I have a PhD, but I believe that crap. You know, it's not about intelligence, it really isn't. But people who don't understand social psychology and how the mind works, they, and this is, this is um, the fundamental attribution error. Have you ever heard that term in social psychology? The fundamental attribution error is if you're trying to understand his behavior, you over-attribute individual variables or personality variables, and you underestimate social influence variables. Right? Guys so instead of saying Steve was dumped by his girlfriend and women flirted and seduced him, it was like, what was wrong with Steve? He was weak, he was stupid, he was looking for a father figure, he didn't have a right, a proper religious education. Uh -uh. I've been doing this work for decades, and I can tell you some of the brightest people in the world have been co-opted by authoritarian cults. The good news is people wake up and they go, this isn't working. One of my friends was in Scientology for 30 years and got to OT7, which is almost the top of, of the, uh, the bridge to total freedom, is their, their crap uh, way of saying it. And what helped her get out was a Dutch person being kind and generous and saying, I really, I really want to understand. You're intelligent. Help me understand. And later, she, he said to her, are these your friends, meaning Scientologists? Because, and, and she started thinking, he's the enemy, but I like him. And I want to be more with him than I want to be with the group that I've been in for 30 years. And she exited. And she's thrilled. And she's got a big YouTube channel, Tori Christmas. People want freedom. They don't want to be exploited and abused. And I'm not sure, you mean, you live in China, and but... My thesis is that in given a choice, people want to be free. They don't want to turn on <laughs> their, their lives to somebody else. To there was something I just yeah. wanted, I didn't have time to show it, but there was a study of internet behavior, and they looked at web activity and how it clustered together, and it clusters on the basis of geography and language.
And if you look at China, one is the least isolated and infinity is the maximum isolation. China is actually least isolated in terms of its internet. So in terms of its internet usage. So if you remove Except the they have a total yeah, uh, block around Well, that's the irony. They don't, wouldn't actually need to do it, you know, in order to maintain that level of social yeah, control general. because people self-censor. I would that's flip the, that's the to door. identity. But yeah. they, so I did. These guys and every one of you know all kinds of things that I, I, I'm clueless, have all kinds of abilities. <coughs> you know. However, there's a difference between saying, if I don't know all the answers, I can't act, and I know enough. See, we know enough that there are really dangerous threats. We know that Goebbels and Hitler really were there. We know Mao and Stalin. We know that stuff. We, we know enough to know that. And I would say in terms of the cage, if we do not have serious structures of justice, we will have to suffer serious injustice. Yes, I, yes. I call in. Being here, I, I appreciate very much and trying to ask a question. Go for it. We, we we have to, like two minutes. All right. But people are welcome to stay a little longer because it's lunch. But, but, but I'm if curious. You need to go. I'm just gonna... In listening to this, if y'all know of the group of this mind freedom for David Oates, the, because coming out of the mental treatment, I have many questions. And part of it is the nature of law, been very linear. But here are a volume of people, Mind Freedom or Robert Whitaker, who writes about Mad in America, the struggle as we take on psychiatry. But it's really the pharma, but it's really the money. Yeah, money is so, corrupting politics in the US when the Supreme Court said people could donate. But if, Black money, dark money. But if you talk about money no. and hashtags and internet and the machine, what keeps a people or the people of the tribe to peacefully assemble and just just in that act to declare my, victory and show up? Because so it is in that crowd the migration because this I would try to study, but to understand the social thermodynamics. The, the science, the art, the integration. What, what is keeping that from happening? Because when you look at all systems. So I'm going to interrupt you for sure. Jeremy. No, no, no. I think the solution to the planet is psychoeducation. Like, teach everybody. Like, what's healthy development? When I'm counseling people who are born in authoritarian cults, and maybe their family's still there and is shunning them. They don't know what's normal. Like, I have to explain, like, having sex with adults when you're four years old is not normal. Which or is, healthy. Or Even healthy, it's like the children of God and such. But I can teach them. And what's so incredible is our minds are so powerful that people can do rewiring of neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. I help people be themselves, go back to their core authentic self. Yes, I just been at um, SIU School of Medicine in Springfield, Illinois, formerly at the University of Chicago. I've been a psychiatrist for a while. I'm used to training and teaching uh, patient care one person at a time. But there was a movement in my field when I was a resident and a little bit longer afterwards in group relations. How do you work with large groups? What are the interactions? The, un, the hidden group, the explicit group, and so on. And this discussion, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm going to trip to more words because there's so much to talk about. But so I'm going to do a blog and include the video of this, no, by the way. So I'm, if you want. I'm wondering if you can, again, speaking about deprogramming and individual interactions related to the treatment of people involved with this. Do you have any references or can you suggest some references for group relations approaches to this? What my brain is doing with your question is how do we scale what I do individually? 
to help everybody. And I've been calling out to everybody who has a loved one in the cult of Trump, don't lose contact. Be warm. I miss you. Remember the good old days when we used to fish together or we used to play racquetball together. I want to hang out with you. Let's put politics aside, whatever. Because what works for the cult leaders is isolation. So they're programming the person, you're being persecuted. And you're, you should be noble because you're being persecuted. But if you take the, the approach of love and help me understand, <clears throat> It really works. Why? Because the person's real self is still in there. And it, it doesn't work to be in an authoritarian cult. If, and, the, and I did a TEDx. I did a four-step reality testing strategy. You can go on my website and watch it if you want. I say you need to unplug from the constant indoctrination through our cell phones and platforms. Take a week off. Go fishing. Do something fun. Second study models of authoritarian control. Robert Lifton, Margaret Singer, my bite model. Of then deliberately seek out critics and former members. Why? Because if what you're doing is good, you're intelligent, you should be able to discern whether or not it has validity or there's evidence or not. So if you want to really answer the question for yourself whether you're brainwashed, Read the stuff on Chinese communist brainwashing or Hassan who's a moon. And then lastly, go back in time in your mind before you got involved with the group or started changing, being radicalized, knowing what you know now. If you knew then what you know now, would you have joined? Would you have gone to that next meeting? Like if I knew those women were were not interested in me, they were just trying to fulfill a recruitment goal for the week, and, and sexual seduction was one of the major tools, I would have told them to get lost. I wouldn't have said sit down and tell them my life story, right? So, but what I'm trying to say is that dual self that I talked about, it's like if you're educated, you can go back in time and deconstruct your cult identity and how they got inside your head. Like for me, I was brought to see the Exorcist movie in 1974, bust up to Tarrytown, and Moon gave a lecture, God made the Exorcist. This movie is a prophecy of what will happen to you if you leave the Unification Church. I grew up Jewish, we don't believe in Satan and demons, but I was, that, that shut me down for two and a half years, afraid invisible deity, you know, beings were uh, going to invade my mind. So they taught me thought stopping to say pure, crush Satan, crush Satan, Lord, have a piece of whatever. As you were saying, the self censoring mechanisms mm -hmm. that I was taught. But as you can deconstruct it, you're liberating yourself. And it works. But what's happened with mental health professionals, and I'm doing a whole course, online course for mental health, people are coming in with suicidal thoughts, or this or that, and clinicians are not asking the history. I would take a different tack. My whole career, I make, had to maintain a very impenetrable firewall between my personal political advocacy and my professional work. And in the last couple of years, in the last couple of years, patients repeatedly brought in their concerns about politics as a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. I, I think what, what I would say, Steve, time matters, attitude matters, other people matter. Yeah, but I have a video on my YouTube of a woman who was in a Bible cult for 13 years. She exited, and she was in institutions and, and given drugs for 11 years before she called me and said, you wrote a book and you mentioned my group. And I did work with her for four days and she didn't need medication anymore. And she went on to get a PhD, get married and have two kids. And she's a nurse. I was trying to say your work matters and it's valuable and thank you. <laughs> no, but the, the, there is a point that, that until everybody gets out of the CERN what's ethical and unethical, and we adopt a, a, a more positive attitude that we can make change. These 
30, 40 million people can exit, but it's going to require a very strategic approach. But it starts with their family and friends saying, hey, I love you. It's I not an you. attitude. It's scientific evidence-based. But is it, is it an issue of if there are so many that are being hurt, is the question for those who have been hurt, it's as if the challenge is to try to learn law enough to come find the attorney or as a statute of limitation because to frame these cases they're very complex and it takes Thank a you, lot Bernard. to unpack. There are general themes and it's specific in each instance. Yes, yes, but each human is unique and to understand the uniqueness of the gift of the lights within the vessel to, to bring them to the court. The universal manifests in infinite ways. Yes, it is. So, thank you so much for coming, and um, hopefully this has provoked some curiosity, and you'll think you want to learn more, or think about how it might help your practice, or a loved one in your life that you haven't talked to for a few years. And reach out and say, hey, I miss you. How you doing? Thank you very much. Thank you.